OG, OG Jalagi, we are the Cherokee Township, the Central Texas Cherokee Township. Um, we're a group that's funded by the Cherokee Nation out of Oklahoma. Uh, that's a culture group for the Cherokee members that are, live here in Central Texas and the people that want to learn about Cherokee culture that live here in Central Texas. So we, everyone can join us. Our meetings are open to everybody. Um, come learn with us. Come talk with us. We go around. We try and talk about corn. Um, one of our big projects this, this last year and then into this year was getting people to plant the three sisters. So um, we're going we're gonna to start off with a couple stories about the three sisters. It's, I, I've, done, I've been to a couple of these talks and it's been, you know, soil samples and nitrogen and, and uh, maybe some, some uh, hardiness zones. And I don't know anything about hardiness zones or color samples or anything else like that. I, we're going to talk to you about stories. We're going to talk to you about uh, how these plants are kind of like our relatives and how we treat them that way and how they're going to work for us when we work for them and they're not commodities that we can just kind of harvest. These are the three sisters. These are um, our family in that way. So when uh, Austin Organic Gardeners took on to take, to take our corn and plant our three sisters, we were very happy to be expanding our family out. So um, that people often ask me who the township is, who's the, te 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 the Central Texas Cherokee Township. And I say, anyone's the township. We're a community. So you don't have to be native. You don't have to be Cherokee. You, what, what you have to do is be in our community and be working for, our, uh, working for all of our interests. So hopefully we can impress upon that. Um, I'm going to tell the story of the three sisters. And then my cohort here is going to tell the story of Selu, who is corn, and her sons. So in the three sisters method, we're going to have to have sisters, right? And I don't know if any of you have twins or triplets or uh, uh, siblings that are close in age to you, but you all fight if you're really close in age. It's trouble. So that's why we're going to create an oldest sister. And our oldest woman is named Selu, and she's corn. So she's going to be like this corn stock. Um, so she's going to be like this corn stalk, and she's going to grow. Now we're going to let her grow about eight to ten inches off the ground, and she's going to grow up, and she's going to be our star child. You know how kids people say that, that don't let don't we, you know we love you all equally. We love Sailor the most. Corn is our favorite. So corn corn's our favorite. Um, we like her the most, and she's what she's going to do is is uh, she's going to grow to the heaven. She's going to be our star child, our valedictorian, our one that reaches for the reaches for the heights. She's going to go up to a Nephilim of the Creator. And so she's going to go. We're going to plant our second child, uh, Beans Toya, uh, Tuya, in the mound with her once she's about eight inches tall so that they don't crowd each other out. So as they grow, they're going to grow together. That Toya is going to, that Beans are going to wind around her, and she's going to use her for support. And whatever she's into, that other sister's into. I mean, you have a sister or, or brother that's into everything you're into. She's going to be the valedictorian. Toya's going to try to be the valedictorian. Sailor's going to be the... The lead ballet, she's going to go be second ballet. They're going to be in there. They're going to be reaching to the heavens together. Beans is always going to think that her sister's supporting her because she's, she's an honor. She's taking her up. But in reality, Koselu uh, uh, takes a lot of nutrients out of the, out of the uh, soil. She takes out a lot of nitrogen. So what she is doing, she's taking all the resources. Her sister, unbeknownst to her, is giving her those resources back. She's fixing that nitrogen. So in the way that... That beans thinks she's being supported by her sister emotionally and spiritually. She's supporting her other sister. They're working together to reach those heights. So that's how we would think of them. Our third sister is squash. Well, in Cherokee, we, we have a word for squash called squashy, but it's a borrowed word. We like, like to add eyes to things. We would say uh, probably ea for pumpkins. Going to be pumpkins, squash, gourds, anything like that. Um, early times, squash and pumpkins were really separated. It's more of a modern idea, but. Um, it would be our third sister, Squash, and Squash isn't going to be like our other sisters. She's going to be tough. She's going to be scrappy. Ever had that third, that, that younger sister who starts throwing elbows and is taking all the toys? She ain't going to take any of this stuff. If they're going to be playing, if they're going to be playing, if they're going to be playing football, or if they're going to be playing uh, uh, ballet, she's going to be playing football. If they're going to be valedictorian, she's uh, she's just she's skipping school. She's not part of this whole thing. So what she's doing, she's going to go along the ground, and she's going to have. Uh, stringy vines, vines with, uh, with thorns, vines that are tough, and she's going to have a fruit that's tough, and she's going to knock down all the weeds, and she's going to keep all the insects and stuff, and the, uh, basically the rabbits and the squirrels and things, out. So if something gets eaten, it's going to be her first. It's not going to be her sister's. She's going to sacrifice herself for her sister's in that way. So all three of them work together, and that's one of the things when you grow them, we want to try to get them to grow to all together, whether or not you get fruit from everybody, and in this tech, in the Texas 
climate that's a little tricky to get fruit from everybody. We did our garden St. Edwards. We didn't get any squash come up. But if, if they all work, if they all are working, they're saving each other. You're going to have a good corn harvest, right, after that. So um, you, you have to see them as a family. They're, they're, whether or not you get something out of them, they're working together. You know, the beans are fixing that nitrogen whether you get a bean crop or not. Uh, sailors go into the heavens whether you get corn or not. Uh, and uh, squash is rocking around the ground and keeping the weeds down and the uh, vermin out whether you get squash or not. So we like to see them as a family. And the women that would go tend the gardens every day because uh, agriculture was uh, uh, a woman's work back then. And men would have to leave the village to go hunting and they'd be gone. Uh, they would go out and they would see them as sisters. That's why they're the three sisters, not the three brothers, because agriculture is controlled by the women um, in, in, our, in that system. So that's the story of the three sisters. It's not so much a Cherokee story. It's actually a Haudenosaunee, an Iroquois story. They're the ones that have the, the three sisters uh, tradition. We have some Iroquois um, uh, links, but our story is a little bit different. And so for the Cherokee story, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. <laughs> Um, I am going to be talking to y'all today about Selu, so corn or corn mother. Um, and really, uh, I guess this story ref is really reflective to me of just what all we can learn uh, from the land and from our relationship with the land, but especially what we can land uh, about our really or what we can learn about our relationship with corn or with Selu. Um, so the story, the Cherokee story of Selu and how Selu came about was. Actually, in, in the beginning, in the very beginning of things, the creator uh, created these two immortal beings, a, a father and a mother, Kanuti, the, the hunter, and Selu, the corn mother. And so Kanuti would go out every day and Kanuti would try to, or would bring back game. So he'd bring back meat and fish. And every morning, Selu would go out and Selu would bring back corn and beans. And um, we know when a, a mommy and a daddy love each other very much that children come about. And so they had these two children. They had two boys that were known as the, uh, the Thunder Boys, and they, they were their sons. And every day they would raise their children in the way to be in the world. And one of those instructions inherently was, do not follow us. Just trust. Just trust and be and know in the land. And um, I don't know about y'all, but I'm a little headstrong. So when my mom says, don't do this, my number one thing is, okay, I'm going to go do that. And so these two boys, the two, the two sons, as they grew up, they would slowly inch their way out and follow their mother uh, to see what was going on. Because they were like, how, are, how is all of this bounty coming to us? How do they get the meat and these crops? And so once the sons grew up a bit, they got about, you know, teenage years when we all feel a little feisty. Um, and their mother, knowing their sons, uh, would look to the sons and say, sons, do not follow me every day would continue to say, do not follow me. And every single day, the children would inch out more and more and more until finally, like I said, around their teenage years, the mother was fi finally, it came to a point where she just knew. She knew that something was gonna happen. So, so she, told the, she told the boys something was going to be coming and stuff. And so the boys ended up actually following her. They ended up following her exactly to the place where she was creating this bounty. And essentially what happened was they, they looked into this shed that was out in the woods and through the through the holes in the wood and through the cracks, they were able to see their mother. And she walked in a circle singing and rattling. Very similar to this. Rattling. And from that rattle, they noticed that bounty started coming from her body, from her groin and from her armpits. Corn and beans and squash came from her body. Um, in these different areas of her body. And this is where this bounty came from for her children. And once they got that bounty and she brought it back to her children, her children said, oh, we know what happened. You're a witch. They forgot. They forgot that she had been caring for them for all of these years. They became so convinced on what they thought they knew. Um, and Selu knew this. And Selu said, I know what you're going to do, but if you listen to my instruction, I will still come back for you. I will still love you. And so these boys, they said, you're a witch. The only thing we can do is kill you. That's all. We have to, we have to get rid of you because they were so afraid. And Selu knew this. And so what Selu did was she instructed them, even in this, in this horror, in this trauma, Selu said, I know what you feel like you need to do. So this is how you should do it. 
You need to take my body outside once you kill me. You need to walk around seven times and drag my body across the land seven times. You need to cut my body in these specific parts and drag those body parts along the land seven times. And I know that can sound a little crazy, but when you think about it, it's actually, it's teaching us how to cultivate corn. Um, and it's teaching us how to be in relation with that corn. And so what Selu did was she told her sons, like I said, seven times. And of course, in the same way that when my mom says, don't do this, I'm going to do it. If she gives me specific instructions, I'm going to color outside the lines just a little bit. So the boys, what they did actually, instead of walking around seven times, they only walked around twice. And so that's actually why corn can only be harvested twice throughout the year and why it's not a continual bounty for us is that those boys did not listen um, to that, to her, their mother's warnings. And so th throughout this time now that these boys had had to struggle to get this corn and to get this bounty. But another thing that happened too was that the father, when he came home, when Kanuti the hunter came home and saw what they had done to their mother, he became angry and said, I'm going to leave you. And so he left those children. And so the children became sad and they wanted to find their father. And they ended up walking far to the east until they came to the Sunland, you know, this land beyond. And when they walked in, they saw their Selu and Kanuti sitting together and they were heartbroken. And they started talking with their mother and their father. Oh. And their mother and their father said, we knew what would happen and we've been waiting for you here. And we would, we want to be with you, but we cannot live together long-term. So they were able to be in community with each other again, but eventually the Thunder Boys, these, these children had to go off to the West and leave their parents because of the, the sin that they committed. But in that still, Kanuti the hunter, the, you know, this, the meat and Selu corn mother, our corn mother in the land, uh, no, 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 no. for us with in that bounty um even when we when we committed this murder even when these boys committed this murder and even when they didn't mind and follow the instruction again Selu corn in her deep love continues on to provide for us and continues to come back year after year even when we don't follow that instruction um and i think it's really beautiful we have a big set of cherokee community values that we like to kind of operate on and one of my favorite cherokee community values is um, and it means treat each other's existence as being sacred or important. But that each other for us is not saying each other as in a person to person relationship. It actually references this idea of medicine or this potential for, for medicine that is in all things. So it's not just the potential for there to be sacredness between a human and a human. It's the sacred potential that exists within all things. Um, and I feel like this story of corn and Selu, our corn mother, really points back to that ability for us to remember to pay attention to those things. Robin Wall Kamerer, she's a Potawatomi biologist. She wrote the book Braiding Sweetgrass. I highly recommend it if y'all haven't read it. But there's a quote in there and she says, ceremony focuses attention so that your attention can become your intention. Um, and I love that quote. And I feel like our three sisters garden just really hones in on that ability for us to focus on that sacred potential that exist within the land and then to refocus our attention to uh provide space for ceremony so yeah what oh so, what, what oh means thank you so when we say that we're saying thank you for listening to us so what oh so i, I, I didn't explain that earlier so <laughs> we're saying it but uh whether or not you can pick up on it or not but we will get you a lot of cherokee in this uh presentation so um as Rachel informed us, the, our relationship to Selu, the corn, is she's the first woman, she's the first mother, she's the embodiment of, um, of fertility and sustenance and all the things that we hope to get. And if we're Americans, as many of us are, and if we have lived in America very long, or other continents as well, we are made of corn. Everything we have has corn in it, some sort of corn. We drive vehicles that have, that, that are, that have ethanol in them that's made from corn. Corn is really a part of us in a way that we just don't always recognize. But the story kind of tells us that, you know, corn is, we're, we're made of corn. We're all children of that corn. She is a Seleji, the Seleji, the, 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 the corn mother. So the story side being very good, um, we're going to talk a little bit about our programs. There's a button posted there. So um, I, have a, I have a sheet to keep me on track here. 
I get I get off track and ran a lot, so let's let me know. Um, so we've seen why the importance of corn. Um, so we're going to talk about our first our first program last year was at St. Edwards. I don't know if anyone's been to St. Edwards or knows of St. Edwards, but it's over on the the other the, just down the road off of Riverside a little bit and on that over, over on that section. Congress, yeah, Congress, and right before um, right before 35, yeah. A very good view of, uh, of, uh, of Austin from there, if you go on top of the hill. If you're at the garden there and look over, you can see a really nice view. So our program with St. Edwards actually won an award from the Cherokee Nation. It's, yeah, hunger, it's the Hunger Fighters Awards, the Hunger Savers, we were awarded here, but it was the Hunger Fighters Award, which is this there right here, Ariona, there. So come up and see him. Tell him, tell him how much you like him. Walk around with him. Um, that's our that's our award for our program with St. Edwards because it was the first time that we we our group had ever kind of partnered outside of our own stuff and tried to actually get more more involved in the community uh, and get this uh, garden together. Um, Roy over there was a really big pusher of that. He wants he's doing a food forest and a permaculture uh, setup. So if you have a chance to go over there, go check it out because he's got a lot of big things going on there. And this is not permaculture, but it's complementary agriculture. So he kind of wanted us there, even though I said, we're not really permaculture, but um, he was cool with us, so he let us in anyway. This is my son, Tony, um, with the bear and our, and our garden there. Um, as we, and there's Roy, and there's me hiding the corn. And so we have our words for corn, our words for the three sisters. So we're gonna have, um, obviously, Salu, corn, Toya, bean, and this is the squashy, which is kind of just the Cherokee squash. Um, toy, toya would or Ia would probably be more appropriate. Um, that would be kind of the way to go. For the three sisters, we have uh, Joey, Dina da la, Dina da la I. So probably you would drop those vowels at the very end of that. I'm I'm just barely learning Cherokee, so there's much better speakers than I am. So if anyone on the screen is criticizing me, you're probably very able to do that. So. <laughs> nope. so this was our corn that we got from out there. So this corn is mostly red. And this is the corn we planted down here this year. Because we're doing a different corn variety over there this year. We're doing white eagle. So the majority of the cobs on this one were red. Um, I don't know if that's soil problems, if that was heat related, or just one. Corn is all um, uh, wind pollinated. So it could be just one of the one of the plants was just the most virulent plant in the group and went out and ever and got everything pollinated. Um, corn pollinates from its picture up here. Let's see, corn. Corn pollinates from its tassel. So see that tassel that's way above my head up there. That's the male part of the plant, and then the silks that you find when you eat green when you eat um, sweet corn. Each one of those is the female part of the plant. So pollen from there goes and falls onto those silks, and each one of those silks is one kernel of corn. So if your stock is a red corn, it gets on all the silks, you're probably gonna only have red corn. Same with blue, white, or yellow. So um, you've, gotta, you've gotta watch that. And if you have corn and you're growing it, and we're trying to grow it close together, trying to close enough to touch. If, you, if there's spaces in between, or you know, like this section got flooded and it all fell out, what you might have to do is take that tassel off of there and, um, let's see if I have a picture on it. So you have to maybe take this tassel, so that tassel right there, pull it off of there and be my little bee worker here, and you slap that tassel onto the, onto the silks. So if you have gaps in your corn and you don't think the wind's gonna do it, you could take that pollen tassel and just kind of take the silks and get, try to get every one of the silks um, taken care of because if they don't, you'll have gaps on the back of your cob. You'll have uh, spaces where they didn't get, didn't get through. So that's, uh, that's one of the, the things. There's actually a story with Kanuti and, and Selu is that uh, um, when Kanuti slaps Selu's belly with a garfish, she's pregnant with the hero twins. And I didn't really understand that story until we started doing this. And these silks kind of look like when we pull them off, they're like, like a string of fish. So I think that they're, re they're telling that story of fertility, but also telling you how to, uh, to, to, uh, to pollinize your corn if you have a hard time. So it's, it's all part of that same deal. So we have more, our corn coming up. And then this is the beans we grew. We grew, uh, um, we grew um, Trail of Tear black beans. And I didn't realize they're bush beans, <laughs> which is a bad choice because we needed pole beans to go on this corn. So if these had worked, 
like we wanted to, they would have taken over the corn plants. So when you are doing the Three Sisters, try to get a pole bean versus a bush bean. When I got these from the Cherokee Nation, they didn't tell me which one they were. I was like, okay, we'll do it, Roy. And, and so they only really grew on, uh, on, we put up some cane poles as supports and because we had to thin out of the corn. And this grew mostly on the cane poles and didn't grow very well on the corn, which was good for us because we got beans out of it eventually. The beans, uh, it looks like they don't germinate. They don't come out if it's over 95. So you want to get those beans in real quick before the, before the weather here kind of gets to them because um, we didn't have any, we got all these big blooms. I said, man, we have so many beans. We have so much beans. We have a pot of beans, 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 beans. And none of them, none of them did, did very well until October when three of the four surviving plants popped up and gave us beans. So um, that's mostly because they, they, so this is the, oh, this is the beans we got out of that. So that's mostly because the, the temperature got below 95 again and they were able to pot. So that can be one of the things. So we're talking about pros and cons of doing the system. The pro obviously is that you have a full on system where you're putting nitrogen in, you're taking nitrogen out and you're adding a plant and a cover that will keep the water in and keep the pests away. So you have to do a lot less weeding, you have to do a lot less um, anything chemical. But the cons are it's Texas and water is a, is, a, is a resource we don't always have. And this system needs water and the beans need to be not 95 <laughs> and squash doesn't also like very hot temperatures. So you're gonna have to play kind of, if you're doing the three sisters, you're gonna have to play with the inputs, which corn you can do, which beans you're gonna do, which uh, squash you wanna try and do, maybe do a gourd or like a, 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 pot, a patty pan squash was the one I, that was that the peas grew very successfully. That was pretty hard, kind of resistant to the beetle. So um, you just kind of have to figure that out. We're trying to do the, the Cherokee varieties because that's our that's our purview. But you in your in your gardens, you can kind of experiment for what you want to do. I would just take one variety because you don't want to cross pollinate. You know, if it's possible, corn will cross pollinate. The other ones will also, but they're less likely to if you have them separated by by some by some time. But corn. Within 100 yards of each other, everything will pollinate each other. That's why you got to watch if, you're, if your um, neighbors are growing corn, if you're growing corn, if your neighbors are growing uh, uh, like a GMO corn, you got to really watch because anything that's come over there will come over to your, um, your your thing there. So sounds silly, but this is like a little. This is one of our corn like craft things that we do with our Central Texas Cherokee Township. And to illustrate that in the same way, where if it doesn't get the pollen on it, you will miss like a whole row of corn. And in the same way, if you were to try to grow a red corn and a blue corn at the same time, it could cross pollinate to where you'll have the multi different color of kernels on the actual cob itself. And they did this at, I don't know if you've been to Festival Beach Food Forest, but they grew um, uh, sweet corn and a, and a topi blue corn, that one over there we did bring for y'all. Um, and some of them were blue and some of them were sweet corn and some of them were in this really big swirl, of like a sunburst. And so I gave that back to them. I harvested and gave it back to them. And I said, well, you've got blue, Hopi Blue, you've got Yellow Sweet, and you've got Festival Beach Sunburst because you've got your own corn here. So with our stuff, I mean, if you've got I, – I don't recommend doing that because if you want a good sweet corn, if you mix it with a field corn, it's not going to be so sweet anymore. And if you want a good field corn that you can use for nixtamalization and flour and cornbreads, it's going to be – the sweetness is going to, it's going to spoil it. You're not going to have, not be able to do that. Same thing with popcorns. If you have a popcorn variety you like and it mixes with one of our flower corn varieties, all of a sudden you've got your, your 70 or 80% pop rate down to like 20. So you've kind of, you, you know, uh, if you are going to hybridize or try to do it for an open source, do it within the genres of being, whether you want flour, a sweet corn, or a um, popcorn. Don't, don't try to mix that. And if you're doing a heritage corn, try to keep it the heritage breed because that's what you, that, the genetics is what you're looking for in that particular one. So... This is what we did down at the, so when you do go down to the garden, if you do go down to the garden at some point when it's not dark, we plant in mounds, not rows. So um, we have the mounds up here. And um, basically what the reason we do this is because when um, we just need to be up, but we didn't have machineries that could, that could make rows in the old days. They had, to, they had to do this all by hand. But part of it is, is that, um, like she was saying here, is that when you plant your 
uh, bean, your, your, your corn is going to come up. You can plant your beans in 360 degrees around it. So wherever the sun is, you can plant two or three around it instead of having to do it on either side of the row. The other thing is that when you get your, when you get your squash going, this gives room for the squash to kind of vine around those areas. If they have to jump the rows, sometimes they'll cut the beans off because they're, because they're, they're, they're spiny and they're hard. So if they get between the beans and the corn, they can, they can choke out the beans out of that. So the reason we do mounds is that it, it facilitates the, the three sisters a lot better. Um, you can do rows. Don't stop me from doing do, do rows if you want to. Uh, but but you have to watch out that they will jump the mounds, or the the squash might just make a beeline down your row and leave the garden. So keep keep an eye on them. This was the Cherokee uh, red corn or the Cherokee flower corn that we planted down here today. But this is we planted St. Edward at the same time or yeah, same time last year, and that's how it kind of came out. So that was our St. Edward's project. There's some buffalo, food sovereignty. That thistle that he had that photo of, yeah. that is what's at the end of this. Yeah. And, and with that, um, do you want to talk about the, 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 the blowgun side of the three sisters? Sure, yeah. Okay. So, so, that, so there's, that, there's the, three, there's the um, vegetable side of the three sisters, corned beef squash, but there is a second side. There is. Um, and so... The second side to this is obviously, uh, like Doug said, the, oh yes, excuse me. Sorry guys, hi. <laughs> um, like Doug said earlier, um, men would oftentimes go out to go hunting. And so it left women at home to do this agricultural work, which side note, uh, I heard a quote from uh, uh, Miss Kay Bell in Waco. She's very much associated with, fem I think it's that female agriculture or female farmers of America or something like that out in Waco. But she told me there is no culture without agriculture. And I thought that was such a profound statement just in general. But to go back to the blowgun. So like I said, men would go out to go hunt. So it would leave women and children at home. And so children from a very young age would be given a blowgun, oftentimes leveled to their size. So you can see here actually that this one is a little less than six feet tall, about, yeah, a little less than six feet tall on a good day. Um, and so that's a little bit proportional to my size. Now I will say generally blowguns would have been about eight to 10 feet tall and that's commiserate to, or, you know, equal to the cane that would have been available to us. So this old growth cane. So with the destruction of habitat and things like that, we don't have access to that height or that type of cane anymore. So this is probably about the, the tallest that you will find a blowgun these days is this river cane. And how it was made actually was it would have been, you know, cut off at the end and they would have gotten a white hot coal and shoved it down in there and pushed it all the way through to smooth it out. So these blowguns would not have been completely straight. So it kind of becomes a really intimate tool for the user, just in the sense of one, I don't want anyone else's nasty mouth blowing on it. And two, I, you have to really use it as a tool and practice with it. It has a natural bend to it. So you have to get used to how to hold it, how to blow on it and everything. And so I have like a very specific notch in here that I always look for as my, my sight when I'm blowing on this kind of a thing. And it almost, I honest, I honestly call it very similar to a harmonica, like the way that you blow on it. Um, but children would be given these tools. And so while the women would be tending the fields, children would go out and hunt small game as a way to supplement the diet. So they would have the corn, the beans, the squash, but they would also have small game meat like rabbit or squirrel or even turtle. My mom always joked about loving turtle stew when I was growing up. And I was like, no, but even turtle you can get kind of a thing. So I'll show you all how this goes. So. So you have to practice, Ooh. definitely. I know, gosh, that was a hit for sure, right? So you just place it in where it's like just at the tip right here. Um, and I like to place my lips over the actual hole itself, but you'll breathe in a little bit. And then it's like, a, I like to go like boom, with it. Again, similar to how you do with a like a harmonica making those different consonant sounds. Um, but like I said, the, there is a very, I'm looking for the site right now. It Mine slightly bends so you can see all of my stuff is going to go to the right because I just haven't practiced in a while. That was so bad. But yeah, so it takes a while to practice and stuff, but it was a way to supplement that diet style. So yes, question. What is that cane made? What's the plant? It's uh, American River cane. Yeah, it's uh, it grows. So talking about the length of it, 
It grows a lot longer in the east where, we, where the Cherokee were removed from, the eastern tribes were removed from. It grows about this good in Oklahoma where our tribe is based, and it grows even less here when we, when we find it. We can find bamboo more often. The bamboo has, uh, and the bamboo that grows here is very similar. But the thing about it is, is these notches are much um, further apart, and the membranes are thinner on a on a ri on a river cane. So it's a lot easier to make the thing, make the blowgun. You can make them out of bamboo, and of course, the Asian cultures have been doing that for as long as we've been making them out of river cane. But it is for us a lot easier to make river cane blowguns than it is to make bamboo guns. But you know. Um, it's a yeah. It's it's a, it's American cousin of bamboo. They're they're in the same. I believe they're in the same genus. Yeah. Yes. And what is the dart? So the dart is this thistle plant. So that thistle that this thistle up here, we pull that off of there and we put it on a bamboo skewer. And you take a piece of string and you tie it onto there. And so the darts we can make here because there's lots of thistle. The cane is harder to find here than than in Oklahoma for most. Yes. Am I Thistle is edible. Is thistle is not poisonous? The, the the this thistle and the um, the bull thistle and which I believe this is and then uh, Scottish thistle are both actually edible. So when you suck them in, it doesn't feel good on your mouth, but um, it won't it won't harm you. So he she'll bring it around to show it to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I. And I'll say that that system, the uh, system that, that the, the three sisters and the, the, the children having um, the blowguns basically ensured that the women and children are always in charge of nutrition. So that's why the Cherokee society is a matrilineal society. The, the women and children are in charge of society. The men don't own houses. They don't own um, fields. They have to leave during the day to go hunt or do something, fish, get, just get to go. Um, and if they come back with nothing, that's not a big deal because the, uh, the women and children do have that sustenance. And uh, if there's a war or the men don't come back for some reason, none of those women and children are like destitute or wards of the states or anything. They're in charge of that nutrition themselves. So they're not going to go hungry because the men are away for a certain period of time or indefinitely. So that's how the matrimonial system kind of works because the women and children are in charge of the majority of agriculture. And because they're in charge of corn, you have to be on a good terms with the woman to eat. You know, so if your wife kicks you out, you have to meet your wife. Your, your mother has to take you in. If your mother won't take you in, you have to leave town because otherwise you don't eat corn. And so in the Cherokee society, um, basically, if a man just upset his mother's fa his, his, his wife's family or upset his wife, they would take his stuff because they would live, they live communally. They would take his stuff and put it outside the, the house. And when he came home and saw his stuff, his belongings outside the house, he said, oh, I'm a free man. <laughs> and he had to go go back to his clan, go back to his mother. And like I said, if he'd upset the village to the point that his mother won't take him in, then he's, he gets to go in the woods and try to find a new place to be. So, um, but that's part of the way that the women um, control society and why we have a matrilineal system versus a, versus a patrilineal system. So aside from great three sisters, but three sisters, it, you know, when you go down this rabbit hole with three sisters and corn, and when we think about corn, a lot of those aspects of who controls society and who controls the agriculture are built into that system. So, um, but that, yeah, that's our, that's, that's our, our three sisters. Um, this is the uh, corn smut that we grew. It's one little kernel. So I ate it. It was delicious. I didn't die. You'll be fine. If you grow corn, if you grow, how do you say it in, in Noel? Noel? If, you, if you grow wheat Lakote or corn smut, eat it. Delicious. It's very good on tacos. And so they serve it at fancy restaurants now, much more than they used to. Also, you love it. You can get it frozen. Well, it only lasts for um, it only lasts for um, for a couple days once you find it. So that brings us to this year's projects. So who do we have working for us this year, or who are we working for this year, or who was our community this year? So. St. Edward's was our big one last year, our, our kind of our pilot program. And so ne this next year, I went to everybody's events and I said, hey, you guys want to grow corn? And I go to one other event, I said, hey, you guys want to grow corn? And I bring corn and I do throw around corn for everybody. And so we had a few takers. So obviously we had St. Edward's, which we just planted last Thursday. So the corn's in the ground over there. So if you ever go to St. Edward's and go up to their fields, you'll see our corn. You might see one of our signs. Probably not that one, but um, our next 
uh, uh, got, we got into Red Salmon Arts, which is the Resistencia, Resistencia Bookstore. I didn't say that right, but that's what it's called. <laughs> Have you ever been down there? They're over on Riverside now. They moved from their Cesar Chavez location over to Riverside. Uh, they've got our corn. So this was from that planting. So you see we have a hard worker there making, making, the, corn, making the corn mounds. And we planted the blue, or it's blue corn, but it's called Cherokee White Eagle because it's got a white stripe on one of the blue parts. So that's the corn you'll see over there if you do go over there. I encourage you to go over there, sign up for their volunteer days, check out the corn, commune with the corn, get to know your mother, don't disobey her. Yes. That's, that's our hard worker putting the corn in the ground, the shark friend. <laughs> and uh, so we planted St. Edwards last, last Friday. We planted um, Red Salmon Arts on February 24th. And today we planted Silker Botanical with the Austin Organic Gardeners. Thank you, Wado. Wado to everyone here for, for, plant, for planting our corn and taking care of that thing. We had a nice little uh, set down there. We got those corn, corn mounds up in no time flat. And, Chopped it in and put it through, and there's a fish emulsion, and we sang songs and thought, thought, thought good thoughts, and hopefully it'll all come up real nice. Can you explain the tobacco that we did? We put tobacco down. Um, I do that now because, you know, it worked really well with the other one. Uh, in the old days, people have asked me before um, <clears throat> if they did anything to prepare the soil, like, ceremonially. And I've heard of some tribes using fish and having fish out there and putting that down in the bottom um, and, you know, and then it would also obviously add nitrogen to the soil and do things. I've heard tales of uh, that the Cherokee used uh, uh, deer. They would kill a number of deer and put them in the fields. And in our story, that makes a lot of sense because remember, Selu's husband's Kanuti, the hunter. So the, the meal he would have fed her would have been deer. So the idea that she would want that, right? She would want that deer. Um, we have our, we have our, we, we don't have a deer or those other things. So we put, we put some tobacco in there just to um, kind of... <clears throat> Um, just kind of separate, get the fields together. But tobacco also has um, insecticidal purpose uh, uh, properties, the nicotine. The amount we put in is not going to do anything, but in, in our mind, it'll be protection, it'll be helping, it'll, it'll, it'll it, hopefully if it works. If it works, doesn't work, then we'll do something else next year. But this year we do that. And, um, you know, we sing our songs and have our good thoughts and everything will be good, hopefully. Um, so that was today. And uh, we are also working with uh, the PEAS program. Its flagship is at uh, Cunningham, University, uh, Cunningham, Cunningham Elementary. We gave them corn. We haven't had an idea of when they're going to plant it yet. They haven't talked to us during a presentation out. But if they want one, we'll do one. And then uh, a fellow named Howard Hawi is going to grow our white eagle. He's the one who had the bloody butcher. I don't know if I've been to a couple different events. If you've seen that red, really red corn I've been bringing out, that was all from him. It was a bloody butcher, which is not tied to a specific tribe, but it's a really good corn for grits. It's really good. Um, uh, for nixtamalization, really good for grits. So um, with that, those are our current programs. Those are our current um, things. If you know of anyone else who wants to plant some before the end of the year, before the end of the month, you know, or if you want to plant your own at your home, we have uh, four different varieties over there that you can take. Um, so that's, that's, we're trying to get you to grow, grow corn. We didn't convince you that we need corn. We've got, we've got, we, we hopefully sold you on the idea of corn, corn, corn. Um, the other th aspect of the corn that I'd like to address, that's me playing sick ball. Uh, the other aspect of corn we want to address is nixtamalization. Has anyone heard of nixtamalization or know what nixtamalization is? I see a big hand in the back over there. So uh, for everyone else, nixtamalization is the process where you change the chemical makeup of corn. So corn actually has a lot of uh, 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 niacin in it and vitamin B but you can't access it. It's in its natural form, you cannot get to it. And so the, the corn smut actually changes that chemical makeup, the, the fungus does, and lets you uh, access some of that niacin. But if you don't do anything, you can actually eat yourself to death on corn. You'll get a, you'll get a disease called pellagra, where you'll be adverse to light and you'll, uh, you know, your, your skin will get pale, you'll be craving meat, so you might be all bloody. You'll become a vampire, so don't become a, vam don't become a vampire. Yeah. Um, don't, don't get vampirism, nixtamalize your corn. So uh, what we do when we do nixtamalization, and if, uh, if, in the, if we get a good set of corn out of here and this group wants to have a nixtamalization um, uh, program, we're more than happy to bring that in. Uh, but basically what you're going to do is you're going to take, it's, it's through kind of the reverse of making beans, where when you have beans, dry beans, you soak them overnight and then you cook them the next day. In nixtamalization, we're going to add uh, our corn, 
and a um, alkali solution. So it can be lye, which is very dangerous. So don't, don't do that, but I've seen the old timers do it. Um, <laughs> pickling lime, which is much more safer and, and much, safe, much more available. Or wood ash, which will get you a, a kind of somewhere between pickling lime and lye. And so you can add one of those three um, uh, alkali solutions to your corn. You cook that solution with your corn for about 30 to 40 minutes. On a, on, on, first out of boil and then just bring it to a simmer. Watch what you're doing because it's going to create acolyte fumes. So have the fan on or do it outside. And then what you're going to do is you're going to turn off the heat, cover it up, and put it over to the next day. And you're going to, next day, you're going to see that the corn has the outer casing, that, that outer hard shell, which we cannot digest if you've ever eaten corn and had to look at it later. You cannot digest that outer coating. That coating gets dissolved off and the um, calcium in the lime will bind to that niacin and release it so that you can digest it. And from there, you're going to make um, tortillas, you're going to make uh, masa, you're going to make tamales. We're going to make grits because we like grits. Um, we're going to make uh, cornbread, nixtamalized cornbread. We're going to make our recipes. There's actually a bunch of recipes over there, which anyone can take. we got bean bread and mm -hmm. some of the some of the corn uh, fried hominy and things like that. You can take that and look at those and take them if you want. Um, but um, but yeah, so when you do that, when you have hominy grits or you have um, nixtamalized corn or tortillas that have been nixtamalized, you can eat that all the time. You can eat that every day, all day, every day. And the Aztecs knew that. And they tried to tell the Spanish, and they didn't listen to the, the Spanish didn't listen. And they took corn to Eastern Europe, and they made them grow it like wheat, and they ate it. And this is about the same time as vampirism <laughs> uh, occurs. It's 1500s, because so many people got pellagra, and I just described the, the symptoms of pellagra are very vampiric. So uh, at the same time, there were stories about vampires beforehand, but the idea that the vampires are burst to light and are pale skin and seeking blood the corn had a lot to do with that because a lot of people in Eastern Europe got pellagra. A lot of people during the Depression got, got pellagra because they forgot how to nixtamalize or they're getting corn from subsidies and just eating it, grinding it up and eating it. Even today, I'll see guys in these homestead got things and they'll say, okay, I grew my own corn. I'm going to make corn flour and grits. And they don't nixtamalize it. And, and they eat that every day for breakfast and nothing else and you'll have a problem. Now, one of the other solutions is to eat beans because beans will put that niacin in your body. So if you use the three sisters... You can actually get away with that for a long time. But if you're just going to eat corn tortillas and tamales or, or grits, you're going to have an issue at some point. So keep that in mind if you grow corn. Do nixtamalize. If you're buying corn products at the store, make sure that they're hominy sources or masa or something that's – that. if you turn the ingredients over and you see the words uh, – I think it's calcium hydrite. Uh, or, li or, or lime, like not the fruit, but the mineral, or lye in the process, that's taken out of it, but in that it made it nixtamized. So that's, that's what you want to look for when you buy cornmeal uh, or grits or things like that. But, um, and so, it'll double in size, so you can, oh, yes. you can tell when that nixtamalization process is complete. It's not like a, you'll wake up and be like, I wonder if it's done. Yeah. You'll, you'll it, look it, at it and it's done. Yeah. It's if, the, this corn here, well, this corn here, I nixtamalized, it turned a dark yellow. It changes color to darker, a darker color. It will get between two to three times larger and it'll smell like you have fresh moss on the house. You'll smell like you're cooking, cooking tamales. You will know that it's happened. So um, just make sure that next day you wash off all that um, solution because that solution is caustic to you. And, uh, and then you have good, good old, good old uh, hominy is what you have, so you can do anything you want with it. Is there any questions about corn or our programs or life in general? Yes, sir. How do you spell nixtamalization? Oh man, you know. And I, I can tell you right now, there's actually a really good uh, taco place called Mixta yeah. in town, I, but it's N I X T A is how it starts. This is what I wrote. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, once that, so the, the question, I'm going to repeat it for the, for the folks up here. So they get it to, it's at what time would you plant the squash because you plant the corn at, you know, eight to ten inches. And then it's once the, once the beans start vining, and they're on the stock, then you can plant the uh, 
you can plant the squash because then they won't cut each other off. If, if you plant the squash or and if you plant it all the same time, I've heard that too. People say, you just put all three seeds in the same hole. That's what I heard the natives did. And I'm like, well, you could do that, but you're going to get squash because squash is going to come up and knock everything down because they're the, they're the bully of the garden, right? So, um, yeah, once that, once those, uh, once those uh, beans are vining on the, on the stalk, you're, you're pretty much good. I, I recommend anything you can grow. Anything that's as is what I recommend. We're going to try uh, possibly seminal pumpkin here. I have some Cherokee rice we can try, um, but I've been told about a boar beetle. A boar beetle. Um, I did. We did a candy roaster, and I I grew it. I grew, tried to do it three times. I only got one huge squash out of it, and that was it. So, whichever squash you think will work, and then also you can use gourds if you have gourds for craft projects or. You, you know, you make gourd masks or you make gourd art, um, and you don't want, you know, yeah, a gourd, gourd rattle, and you don't want to, you don't care about squash, the, the gourd will serve the same purpose and you can do something else with it. Um, so it's up to you. Uh, I would say, I would say specifically grow an heirloom corn, grow a non GMO corn, grow something other than sweet corn because you go to the center today and all they're going to have is sweet corn seeds. Grow a flower corn that you can make into some grits or some cornbreads or something that we all, you know, every kid in Austin knows what a tortilla is. So, um, yeah, so grow something like that and then pick your pick your squash and beans based on how successful you are. I would also say, I'm a, so as a, as a Texas master naturalist, and I'm sure there's probably a few others in here, um, you know, we talk about native gardening or native planting and things like that. And so a big thing with our Central Texas Cherokee Township is we're trying to acclimate our three sisters approach to this Texas environment. So we're also looking for feedback from y'all. So if you find a native pumpkin or gourd or squash that is really successful, like we want to know, because at the same and in the same way we're you want to talk in front of us. Yeah, sorry, excuse me. If y'all so if y'all find a, a specific varietal of squash or specific pole bean that works well, we would love to know that because in the same way, like yes, we're working in a three sisters perspective, but we're really trying to be. Uh, like full circle and holistic in our approach. So like, like we said, water is a big issue here. So if we can find a gourd that is like a buffalo gourd or something, if buffalo gourd could work really well with this, we just haven't tried it yet. So if y'all try it and it works really well, we would love to know that just so we can all kind of share this knowledge together in that way. Did you have a question back there? Yeah. Uh, I have two. Uh, I tried to grow corn about 20 years ago. And I had a project of sublimation didn't go well. Okay. I, I, I wondered about that. I wasn't yeah. sure how I quality it. Wow. It was good though. Yeah. One year, Always one year, is. One year old, the soil the one of men did because I nitrogen. It's gonna be nitrogen. So I mean, I don't like to tell you to use chemical nitrogen or anything like that. So if you've got something that's got nitrogen in it, but it, it needs nitrogen. So, you know, 2400 of something. The fish emulsion works really good. Um, um, if you've got the cover crop, like the seeds that was given out earlier, and the beans, you like the beans and the cover crop stuff fixes that nitrogen in there. It's nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen. For corn, it's always nitrogen. If, you're, if your corn isn't coming up, it's usually nitrogen. I feel like Three Sisters was like nature's original, like compost approach to. Did you have, it's like that. Did you have another question then? Yeah. When you were talking about the pollination of the sock to the silk. Yeah. Do you break off the Yeah, just break one off. And then you can just shake it over the shoulder. Break it off and start slapping. I didn't want to break and I think it. way back there, did you have? Oh, I was going to say that uh, most of the uh, matzo or uh, tamale uh, mix that you buy from like El Milagro is pre-mixed Yeah. So if you're looking to have someone else do that part, yeah. there are some of that. And, and at the, some of the at some of the uh, the the Hispanic stores, the fiestas and stuff, they have nixtamalized dried corn already. That's already nixtamalized. But all masa is nixtamalized. As far as I've never seen one that wasn't. So um, it, you can always bet on that. Um, a few things. Do you know if um, if Barton Springs Mills, if their cornmeal is nixtamalized? It 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 is not. But they they do offer. I think they offer classes on how you can do it. So uh, some of the three of these varieties we have here are from Barton Springs, Barton Creek Mills, mm -hmm. and it's specifically sold as for nixtamalization. So it's when you, and that's, that's actually, it's funny because I buy seeds, you know, from commercial places for other programs, you know, they charge like 12 bucks for two pounds of seed uh -huh. <laughs> and their seeds good. Their stuff is good. And so 
if you find a variety, like they had Bloody Butcher, but it's out. It's not in right now. But if you like grits, get Bloody Butcher from them and nixtamalize it, and you'll have you'll be in heaven because that stuff is so creamy. I, I used to put butter on my grits. I nixtamalized the Bloody Butcher, and I put butter on it. And I thought I put heavy cream in it. It was it was so creamy and so corn tasty. It's like you go to the you go to the, the IHOP or something and get that corn, and it's like a it's like a white rice. It's not there's no flavor in it. This was so flavorful. So uh, yeah, um, Barton Creek Mills is a really good source for uh, open pollinated white open pollinated yellow. Um, and if you do want to, if we do get a nixtamalization class together, that's probably what we'll be using because that's the one I can get in most larger quantities. Uh, that's really good quality for nixtamalization. So. And the other thing is more of a comment. I know um, a lot of people in the Austin Organic Garden community have, have used tattooy squash mm -hmm. because the squash line bores um, yeah. are unable to bore through the tiny... They have really tiny vines. Yeah. But it, it does sprawl. And that's what they had really at Festival fast. Beach Food Force, and it came up real good. They had lots of it. So, and I think they had a whole um, thing where they, they ate it. So, one more. How close do you find We're trying to do somewhere between 12 and 8 inches, and you can thin it out if it gets if it gets too shoved together. And then. Was it last month or a couple months ago that said that we planted the lupas or something? Do you all remember? Yeah, and lupa and lupa will work too because it is a gourd family, so it'll it'll work. Yeah, something. Is, uh, well, some of the gourds you can eat in their infancy, and then they turn more hard. So. So between lupa and corn and the cover crops, we got corn, beans, and squash. Take it home, grow it. If we didn't convince you yet, grow, grow corn. Yes, ma'am. Okay, number one. The 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 three sisters in containers. The I'm gonna for the for the computer here. Uh, the the limiting factor is the fact that that corn is gonna hit the wind and you're gonna blow over, and you need lots of corn to get your corn to go. So I mean, it's not impossible. If you've got like a, a, a nice big trench and you can put like maybe four or five plants there, but you remember you're only going to get maybe one ear, maybe two ears per, per corn. So you're doing it to do it and it might blow over in your, in your patio or wherever it's at um, because the corn, the corn we grow is 10 foot tall. So you put that in a pot, you know, heavy. it's kind of top heavy that the, the blue um, Hopi blue actually is about five foot tall. So I would suggest using something like that where it's a little bit smaller and maybe trying it that way so the wind isn't such a big factor. But you do want you do want them kind of bunched together and you kind of want at least three rows for the wind to kind of pollinate it. If you did it that way, I would definitely suggest taking the tassels off and hand pollinating it um, because you probably won't, the wind, unless it's blowing exactly, you know, back and forth that way is not gonna, not gonna be on your favor, so. And my other question was, will you once again go over it's it's so oh, the nixtamalization process one more time is all it is is you're adding an alkali solution to the corn to dissolve the outer coating and free up the and free up the nutrients so you're just going to add uh, your corn and water to a pot and then put your lye solution in your lime lye or wood ash or whatever a caustic solution you want to put in there you you cook that for 30 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes uh, on, a, on a boil and then a low simmer. Take it off the heat, cover it, take it out the next day, wash it, strain it, you know, three or four times so the water comes clear, and then you've got hominy. And you can do whatever you want from that, with that hominy. Does that have somebody? So is that the method for the big, chunky stuff like this? It's for, that's for everything. So I've made it out of all, almost all the grains over there, yeah. I've, I've used a simpler method for just already ground, mm -hmm. just pouring a lot. You can buy that powdered white stuff yeah. in the, um, the tortilla factory place. Yeah, yeah, it's called Calm. Yeah, and then just put it into double water, like that much. Yeah. Bottom, and then just soak the, the, the grains overnight. You don't even have to and that, and that brings up a, a really good point is that there's, uh, you know, when you get a nixtamalization, there's people that tell you you have to cook it all night. There's people that tell you to cook it for 15 minutes. There's people that tell you you have to cook it for an hour. There's people that tell you that you don't have to cook it all. And honestly, from what I've heard, they all work. <laughs> They all seem to work. As long as you add the corn to a caustic solution and it's in there long enough, you'll you will you will dissolve that outer coating and release the and release the nutrients. Um, just to clarify, twelve to eight in, 
They they don't have to be too tall. So they got like a row, like it's maybe four inches or something. It's just for drainage. Because okay. our because our corn is gonna have a deep tap root, but you know, you have to have it up high. And so um and it, and we want it out of the way for when the squash comes running around and starts bulldozing stuff. And that's why we want to put the beans in that mound too, because that'll keep them off off the line. The the mound we like because again, you can put beans, you can put beans at all four corners of that. And if only three come up and You've got lots of beans, you know, you got your beans. And the more beans you plant, remember, the more nitrogen is fixing, the better your corn's gonna do. So people are like, oh, you can put one plant of beans, like, yeah, you can, but if you put four plants of beans, <laughs> that corn's gonna be, you know, eaten and you're gonna be eaten. So any other I'm curious about the cane that y'all use prior to river cane. Do you know what the native species is? The river cane is a native species, yes. It was one. Okay. Yeah, this is American, what they call American bamboo. It's a cousin of bamboo, but it's it's native to the to the U.S. So it's 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 native to all basically all the Gulf Coast, all the north, I'm not, not northeast, no, the southeast, and this area. So um, and it was way more prevalent. So in the old days, there were breaks of these, and the Cherokee would build their houses out of this. So we weave them like a basket, and then you put a, a, a mud a mud a adobe kind of stuff called daub and wattle is what the, the process. But basically, how you make a, a basket like this, you'd weave that cane. And you turn, you leave that cane, turn upside down, and make a door, and then you put mud all over it, and that's how we built houses. Uh, Cherokees lived in houses made out of river cane. River cane was like there was corn was the most important. She's our mother. Our second most important thing is river cane because river cane was everything. It was our weapons. It was our housing. It was you know anything we built. We built it was our it was Cherokee plastic is what they call it sometimes. More more biodegradable, but. But one of the things that, that when, when they were removing the Cherokees, that's what they would attack. They would cut the river cane down because they knew when we, when we lost the river cane, we couldn't build houses. So they, when they wanted us gone, they would clear the river cane out. So, you know, like the way the buffalo was used in um, the Plains group, a lot of the destruction of river cane habitat was to, to remove the southeastern Indians. Any other questions? Yes, sir. For river cane, I don't know. I, I, I don't know it right off the top of my head. I can probably, if you email or check the, the Central Texas Cherokee Township Instagram and send it to me, I'll, I'll send it to you because I we have a seed program. They give out river cane sometimes too, so to replant it in various areas. Once it takes in, it takes off. It's kind of like bamboo. So you got to be careful if you actually do want river cane because it will come back. A quick but. Google search says... Arundinaria giganti, gigantier. Yeah, yeah. yeah, giant cane bamboo, but yeah. gigantier, I think, is its name, the family name. But so, um, well, come come talk to us afterwards if you have any other questions or any other stuff. We'll kind of wrap it up since we're at past the eight o'clock hour. I just want to say, hey, uh, sorry, just quickly, there's there are a few questions in the chat. Oh, is there questions in the chat? Should we? Do you questions out there? Uh, I don't think there were, no. Um, it says, is it safe to assume some... that the majority of commercial corn products have not undergone nixtamalization? Was one of the uh, yeah, yes, uh, the majority of commercial products have not undergone nixtamalization. Unless it says um, hominy or it's got that process on it, it has not undergone it. And then let me see if there's, oh, and there's a chat right here. One more announcement. For... Uh, so Sunshine Community Garden, they had their plant sale a couple weeks ago. They still have a lot of tomatoes and peppers that are now marked down to a dollar. And I think it's an oh, honor sir. system. Go to the greenhouse. Honor system, go to the greenhouse, and they have like a box where you can put, I think, cash, or you can do a Venmo. So Sunshine Community Garden, which is in Central near UT, they had their plant sale about two weeks ago, and they have leftover tomatoes and peppers, all organic, grown by um, Gabriel Valley Farms, and they're marked down to a dollar. So you can pick those up on any time. I think it's open all the time. I think the gates are open all the time. And it's there's a greenhouse where the, all of the plants are, and it's just an honor system thing where you leave money in some sort of container, or they also have a Venmo. And and with that, we'll say Wado. Thank you for coming up, Wado.
Well, I guess, I'm putting in <laughs> some of the answers to like the we questions were, uh, on the chat, y'all. Technically, uh, <laughs> technically oh, challenged. Like, like, yeah. Like, like, well, and the thing is, we don't. We just we only use it for like background stuff. So it's like we were like, oh, you need to. We don't have the. We, 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 I you know, think not. He was talking about. We can come up with some more data sources for nitrogen, back mm -hmm. guano, and oh yeah. And I couldn't remember if it was blood meal or not. I think it's blood, meal, mm -hmm. but it's it's the high second, the yeah. high first. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. I think it's the blood. Meal. Okay, I'll have to look. At, I'll write yeah. that down. Thank you. I have I have blood meal or not always. Okay, what's got? What do I want it to do? Yeah. Number, yeah. But uh, those are good organic sources of nitrogen. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Like, that one, that one. And see, I don't like anything to tell us how to use that one. I tried to use it one time and it burned my plants. Oh, yeah. Because I thought it was like some baby beans. I mean, I tried this in two weeks. Really? Interesting. Yeah, I, just, I wish I we did. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know how to put back on it. It would be slow. Yeah. <laughs> but what's the science? Yeah. Well, but what's, how do we use it so that it's available for the plants and it's not too much? Right? Yeah. Not to overwhelm them. Oh, this is yeah, it's a little bit of corn. corn uh, oh, here's a piece. I my dad boosted corn. I know yeah. 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 No, yeah I, I, everyone grows sweet corn, so it's like, oh, I'll try something else. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. No, it, but it's one of those things where all that milk corn is mostly grown for like, uh, animals. A lot of that corn is not corn. So. No, I was telling her. Okay. I'm just I'm also a fan of the I got a Yeah, Now, the beans. Yeah, I Well, and then you go to North Carolina. So the, the, these are the guns that we use in Oklahoma, these six footers. And in North Carolina, they use 12 footers. So they can get a big piece of stuff straight away. Nice to meet you, Kelly. I'm Rachel. Nice to meet you. 
I have a summon for the Austin Garden. Oh, yeah. So I can use that to go down and Oh, yeah, it's a cedar wood. I think Austin was telling us about that. Oh, yes, yes. Austin's one of my wife's. Yeah. No, he sealed it. He sealed it. Yeah, I would love to. For sure, I would love to. I actually write. I was talking with Austin. I actually do freelance writing for Texas Parks and Wildlife magazine. Since next year, I can go ahead and give him my card. I'd love to help out. And anyway, we can see. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I love freelancing kind of a thing. So it's it, anything we can do to get our names out there in collaboration and stuff. So that, that would be awesome. I would love that. So just in contact, I would love to help out. Perfect. Yes, that's what he was telling he was telling me about it. Yeah, I have to check y'all out. It looks really interesting and that's like something that's right up our alley. All the work we're trying to do and everything. I think about that a lot in general. I'm, I'm actually a certified in a life doula as well. So I try to use like talk about gardening and approaches to like connecting with the land as a way to remedy eco grief and everything. So that's interesting. Oh, yeah.